Hello and welcome to another session of the juxtaposition lecture series at the Berlin University of the Arts on Contemporary Cultural Production. My name is Lukas Feireis and as part of my visiting professorship here at the school, it is my intention to push um, for a more transdisciplinary, more intuitive, more fragmented and non-systemic thinking and acting, one that actually deliberately refuses disciplinary coherence. So the term juxtaposition really describes the act or instant of placing things side by side to compare or to contrast. And such uh, creative juxtapositions is precisely what this lecture series aims to establish by promoting a critical discourse um, across binaries and boundaries, borders, norms, forms, and protocols that really um, embrace and celebrate the power of cross-pollination and creative entanglement and collaboration, and, and also embracing uh, the kind of all the juxtapositions that make up our lives. Today, we have a very special guest, and I'm thrilled and honored to have Hans-Ulrich Obrist with us, the world's most recognizable curator and one of the most well-known figures in the contemporary world of arts and culture per se. Uh, Hans-Ulrich Obrist is the artistic director of the Serpentine Gallery in London. He is senior advisor at Luma in Arts. He is senior artistic advisor at the Shed in New York. And prior to this, he was uh, the curator of the Musée des Moderne, de Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. And um, since his first show, it was called World Soup or The Kitchen Show, which is more than 30 years ago. In 1991, his life is basically an exhibition that never stops. Um, he sleeps little, constantly travels, speaks five languages, if I'm right. Um, all the while cataloging thousands of hours of artist interviews, editing magazines, publishing more than, I believe, 500 catalogs and publications, and curating more than 300 50 exhibitions. So hands down, there's nobody like him. So welcome, Hans Ulrich. Hans, thank you so much. Uh, so wonderful to see you all and great to see you again, Lucas. I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here today. And um, today we will actually um, go into a more dialogical format, a conversation in which we kind of try to cover the, the vast grounds that make up your professional and personal oeuvre. Um, so um, let's start very basic. How are you and where are you? Uh, yeah, it's great to see you. And um, I'm well, I'm in Switzerland right now. I'm on my way back to London uh, to start the new year uh, and our new program at, uh, at the Serpentine. And I was here for the break in, uh, in Zurich for the, for the new year, yeah. And what has your day been like today? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, um, as often since uh, 2019, there is a lot of Zooms because we, our office is still, you know, mostly uh, working from home. Uh, I don't know about Germany, but in England, it's again advised to work from home most of the week. So um, I had uh, calls about um, our Back to Earth project, which we're going to talk probably about later. We have to do actually with this book I was showing you at the beginning, where Tabitha Vezer also participated uh, we ask artists to do environmental uh, campaigns. So we had a, a Zoom about uh, about that project. And uh, I also um, was doing research here in Switzerland about this whole um, uh, very active blockchain scene, which is here. So that was another thing. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, it's been mostly virtual my day, my day. Yeah, I haven't been on a walk yet. So that will happen after the um, after the talk. Also, it's actually interesting. I, I finally, because, you know, I do these conversations uh, as part of my practice. And obviously, this involves a lot of um, studio visits also. Um, and I started to do, I mean, prior, I would say, to the lockdowns, um, it would have been kind of unthinkable to do studio visits by Zoom or Skype, right? Because it wouldn't have been the right thing to do. But um, over the last two years, it was better to do Skype or Zoom studio visits than no studio visits. And it's actually led in a very interesting way to um, a kind of a, a decentralized activity, you know, of of making studio visits in a more decentralized way. Because obviously, 
when I did when I do physics studio visits are very often in cities, in cities where I am, in cities where I work, um, and uh, actually, you know, throughout the, the, the multiple lockdowns, I've, I've done a lot of uh, conversations and studio visits with artists who live in very remote parts of the world, whom I otherwise probably would never have had the opportunity to to kind of visit. So that's also a daily practice that I do, you know, studio visits, and of course. I also do physical studio visits always where I am. And I mean, it's kind of part of my research is not only to visit um, emerging uh, practitioners uh, and emerging artists, but it's always also looking back and thinking about, you know, pioneering figures. And I was really delighted recently to meet Harald Negeli in Zurich because, you know, as a kid growing up in Switzerland, it's kind of interesting how art came to me or what the kind of contact zone with art because my parents weren't kind of like museum goers or museum visitors. So my kind of, you know, contact zone happened actually through different forms of engagement. And uh, one of the first thing was when, that also was the first studio visit I did when I was like 16 years old, was when um, the timetable of the railway, you know, of the trains was obviously, uh, when I was 16, that's 1984, 85, and that's prior to the internet. So the the train timetable, you know, wasn't online. You should have got a big book every year with the train connections. Um, uh, and uh, the artist Claude Sando had actually designed the cover, you know, of that book. So my parents got this timetable and I was completely mesmerized by the cover of this book and wanted to meet the artist. And that became the sort of first studio visit. The other kind of connection to art happened um, with uh, Emma Kuhns who is a very interesting artist. She's a bit like a Swiss Hilma af Klint, you know, it's spiritual geometry, spiritual abstraction. Um, and she basically uh, was a healer. Um, she uh, discovered the healing qualities of a, of a stone in a grotto in Würenlos. Should you ever be in Switzerland? It's really fascinating. One can visit the grotto um, of Emma. And uh, she, as part of her healing practice, also did this extraordinary uh, absolutely mesmerizing drawings with the pendulum. Uh, and uh, uh, and basically, my parents would always buy the powder, you know, ion. It's a kind of a, you can buy it in every Swiss pharmacy. It's a healing powder. You can, it can be used to, for the bath, or you can, you can also eat it actually. Or one can give it to the plants. It's really, plants love it. They, it's, a, it's an amazing thing for the garden, you know. So it's kind of like a, a, a powder of this magical stone, which can be used for many, many different things. And on a cover of this little package was a drawing by Emma Kuhns. And again, I was magnetically attracted to that and asked my parents for more information and wanted to know about, about Emma Kuhns. So, you know, I think it's interesting how, you know, art can come to us, you know, in other ways than through exhibitions. Yeah, and that, ways, you know, yeah. and then if, if, if exhibitions were not really accessible to me, you know, as a, as a kid. And of course, the third way how art came to me was Harald Negeli, because he's the famous prayer of Zurich. He was also very famous in Germany at some point because Joseph Beuys, you know, took his defense because he would um, make all these graffiti in the 80s and the Swiss, Switzerland is extremely strict um, and, and, and very much against graffiti. So he was actually imprisoned and, you know, Klaus Steck and, and, and Joseph Beuys in Germany made a big campaign to liberate, you know, the artist became a kind of very well known figure. And for me, again, as a 15, 16 year old teenager, this, you know, to see these graffitis in Zurich was very important. So I finally, he's now in his, I think probably late seventies or early eighties. So I went to see him in Zurich recently. So that was a recent physical studio visit. And it was actually really interesting, you know, in to see this archive of all the graffitis and he still does them. I mean, during the lockdown, he did about 50 new ones, you know, in the it's called the Sprayer of Zurich. Uh, sprayed, you know, these uh, sort of death, it was like a death and totem dance, you know, a dance of death um, during the, the, the lockdowns all over the city on monuments and on walls. Uh, and he also um, has an amazing drawing collection and archive actually of Maya Amden. And so, you know, his house is in a weird way as a street art kind of, you know, documentation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's also a, a museum. It was very interesting. Interesting. Um, kind of, you kind of led actually to but the next question I wanted to ask you is really how it all started for you, because I think it's important here also, um, we're talking to a group of students there from first year to kind of graduate students, that it's um, very important for me to show that it's kind of possible to color outside the lines and actually moreover that's actually re recommendable to do so. And on the other hand, that 
everyone, no matter how established, successful or famous they might be considered, has started small somewhere and only cooked with water. So it's, it's, it's nice that you share also these entries into the art form world via a, quite a public realm. So a timetable, um, uh, packaging or the graffiti on the streets. Um, I remember reading also um, um, a story of you kind of first visiting a museum and creating this kind of imaginary museum in your kind of children's room. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Yeah, actually, um, you know, I went to school in Kreuzling and at the Lake of Constance. I think it was kind of important as an experience because it's a dry lander egg, you know, Austria, Germany and Switzerland. And then you go to school as a teenager, you know, and you cross the border every day, you know, like you go to the cinema to Germany, you go in the lunch break quickly to Germany, you would never leave the house without the passport. And I suppose it had a big impact on me, this idea of a daily practice of crossing boundaries and being transnational. Um, but I think that one of the most important experiences of my um, sort of time at Lyceum, you know, in, in Kreuzingen was that I would always pass by this extremely strange um, house, um, which was somehow abandoned in a park. Uh, it looked a bit like, you know, in a way, um, yeah, it'd be somehow um, scary, right? Because it was an abandoned villa, a big villa uh, in, a, in, a, in a park. And um, one day I asked my teachers, you know, what, what's this house? And they explained to me that it was this very famous um, psychiatrist, Binswanger. He was also the subject of Michel Foucault's first book. And uh, that among the patients uh, he treated in this clinic, in the earlier part of the 20th century was a German art historian called um, Abi Warburg. But obviously I had no idea as a 15, 14, 15 year old who was Abi Warburg, but I was very curious to hear from my teacher the story that basically Abi Warburg um, uh, was obviously from Hamburg. And the, I mean, you all know the Warburg archive in London and the, the amazing exhibition of the Nemosin Atlas, which was one of the highlights for me of the last couple of years, the exhibition at the House of Kultur der Welt, was the first time we could see, you know, on the plates. Of, um, of Warburg reunited. Um, but obviously, you know, he was treated um, um, in this clinic of Binswanger for quite some time. And towards the end of his stay there, he did the famous lecture on the Hopi, you know, serpent ritual, his uh, Schlangenritual. It's a very famous text by, uh, by Warburg. And he, he actually did that text as a lecture in the psychiatric hospital for the other patients, right? And so anyway, for me, it was like really, really, important to kind of hear these stories and as a teenager and I kind of got interested in this Abi Warburg Atlas, you know, an archive and encyclopedia. So I started to also collect postcards, you know, inspired by that. And I used all my pocket money to buy thousands of postcards, you know, and I'm basically I kept asking my parents, I needed more money to buy these postcards. So I bought postcards all over Switzerland. I got free into the museums. And I started to have my own imaginary museum, you know, in the Kinderzimmer in my room. Uh, with cardboard boxes, and I would every day install, you know, different, uh, you know, different types of, uh, of shows. But I think the beginning, I mean, it's kind of interesting because I, I then for a long time was in, you know, studying these art historical connections, and it was kind of a trans historical museum. You know, I would sort of combine in a sort of very Warburgian way. I would kind of combine. I was obviously, you know, not fully understanding it, but I did understand that it was about combining the, in finding patterns in different epochs. Uh, and trans historically installed these works. Um, but it's only when I kind of realized through this Cloud Sound on story that actually, you know, there are artists alive working today and that one could actually meet them. And that was a kind of, when I was 16, a, a kind of a breakthrough idea. And then I sort of obsessively would go to studios. I would sort of, when I was 16, 17, I go to Fishley Weiss and then they sent me to Alighiero Boetti and Rosemary Tocco. And, you know, obviously I was this teenager, super young, and all the artists would kind of give me tasks to do, you know, things to do. Um, and a lot of these tasks stayed with me kind of for the rest of my life. So to give you an example, when I was like 17, I arrived in Rosemary Tucker's studio, you know, and I was like 17, she was maybe 35 at that time. And she said, it's like, great, I would visit all these young artists. But, you know, she says, um, uh, she explained to me the story of Louis Bourgeois, you know, Louis Bourgeois just started to have first exhibitions in uh, Europe and had her big first show at MoMA. And she says, you know, finally, these extraordinary women artists get celebrated. But she says, first of all, it's very late. And secondly, there are other amazing women artists all over the world who are not seen, you know. 
So she gave me the task. She said, you just need to go from city to city by train because I traveled always by night train. Something I still do today a lot. I'm kind of my favorite things are night trains. And so um, um, and so I would go from city to city and I would ask the younger artist, I mean, you know, who is a Louis Bourgeois in your town? Who is a, a pioneering woman artist who needs more visibility? And, you know, so the first city I applied, that was my tropical methodology, so as to say, was Vienna. And obviously all the young artists sent me to Maria Lasnik, you know, she's, a, she's an amazing painter. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, she was known in Germany and Austria, but not at all internationally at that time. Uh, and that was the beginning of my very long friendship, you know, with Maria Lasting. And I, I'm still doing this today, you know, so whenever I went to New York, I asked this question, which is how we got, the, it's an important part of the Serpentine program, these, what we call the protest against forgetting, these amazing, you know, artists who haven't had a solo show. So like Faith Ringgold or Luchita Hurtado or James Barno, as a matter of fact, the photographer, you know, last year, at the moment, Arvete de Mac. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of things the artists told me at that time as a teenager, um, you know, the kind of tasks they gave me, um, uh, I still continue to kind of uh, apply them kind of in my daily life. But then for a long time, I didn't do shows. And I mean, when you ask me about the beginning, it's obviously also a question because about the beginning of the practice, right, of curating. Mm -hmm. And I waited with that for quite some time because I, I always had the feeling that I had to learn, you know, and I was kind of worried about this idea if I enter immediately the process of production that I'm gonna kind of run out of ideas. And I felt that, you know, I needed to, I kind of write a lot about these writers who traveled for many, many years, you know, to learn everything. And, uh, you know, in a kind of a grand tour type of way, but obviously, you know, I didn't have the money to make a grand tour. So I did my own kind of grand tour with a Euro rail ticket. And I would always sleep in the train and spend a day in the city and then go to the next city. So I would do 30 cities and I would, you know, visit artists in the cities. I would go to Torino, to Marisa Merz or Mario Merz, and then I would take the night train to Rome and then then again to Vienna. So I would crisscross Europe, you know, because I didn't have money for hotels. And and so I did that for many, many years. I mean, I studied at university and then I would always for months, you know, do these studio visits and I learned and learned and learned. It's only like after five years of doing that, that I felt ready to do my first show, right? And that became the kitchen show. And so I curated an exhibition because obviously, you know, I was 22 then and still a student and nobody kind of gave me a museum as a space. And and I also, I mean, I kind of always felt that, um, you know, the places in, in which exhibitions are traditionally presented are actually invisible to, you know, large sections of society. And as Eduard Glister always said, you know, we we need to think about other forms of engagement. And so from the beginning of my curatorial kind of endeavors, I was interested in finding other forms of engagement, or as Robert Musil once said, you know, that art can appear where we expect at least, you know, that we to do exhibitions in unexpected places to bring art into society. And the beginning of that was the kitchen, because I, you know, wanted to start with what was available to me. Uh, and Michelle Weiss said, you know, because I never cooked, so I had like books in my kitchen, they said you could just make your kitchen into a kitchen and we make you a kitchen altar and then you invite some other artists and Boltanski said the same you know and so I had these artists do pieces in the kitchen and the show had a budget of 200 euros and uh, it had it lasted three months and it had 29 visitors <laughs> so um, and also you know there wasn't money for a photographer so officially Weiss took all the photos for me so the kind of documentation is kind of like an artwork but it's device and uh, and in a way you know I, I suppose that goes back to your question. It's a very DIY approach, you know, but I, I think that DIY approach is not only valid in terms of like a domestic space, but it's also very valid and, and a great possibility in relation to much, much more, you know, public shows. Because mm. at the end of the day, the museum, are, you know, and I've always worked in museums, so I'm not antagonistic to museums, but I've always seen them as a very limited, like it's only one possibility. And there are many other possibilities. And, you know, and if we go into other spaces, um, we need to kind of convince these spaces. And I've always seen it as the job of the curator to kind of, you know, open these spaces and go with art into society. And, you know, that's what we've done with Museum in Progress when we went to see, you know, uh, different companies to bring art into the billboard space. Or when we did a show with Alighiero Boetti on all the airplanes of, you know, Austrian Airlines. Uh, you know, that's also what 
we've done with all the, you know, the poster exhibitions and billboard exhibitions, or do it has to do with that. Or as a matter of fact, also the house museum exhibitions, you know, quite sort of at the beginning of my trajectory, sort of in the later part of the 90s, I was obsessed by this museum in London, the Sir John Soane's house, which if you haven't visited, is the, it's a great museum for artists to visit. It's uh, the house of the architect Sir John Soane's, and uh, it's basically the house where he lived, and it has many layers of his collection, um, very unexpected, you know, like Hogarth's or Turner's who were his friends, but then also branches he would have found on walks, like very mundane objects, but at the same time also Egyptian mummies and, you know, antique sculptures and a lot of mirrors. It's a very dense kind of Gesamtkunst. I could, he later in his life made it into a museum, so the domestic museum. Um, and it's a, you know, a house of many inspirations. And obviously, you know, it's, it's a 19th century house, which he gave to the government and became a, you know, a, a museum. Uh, and we just went there with my friend, Carrie Swin Evans, who was a young artist at the time, and I was a young curator. And we knocked at the door of the director and we said, we want to do a show here, right? And uh, she said, you know, um, let's, you know, sit down and we told her the story and I told her about my kitchen and I told her about the Gerhard Richter show I did in Sils Maria. That was another show I did quite at the beginning. You know, I convinced the Nietzsche house, where Nietzsche or Zarathustra, the little museum in the Swiss arts. I convinced them, you know, to do a show of Gerhard Richter over painted photographs. So, I mean, this kind of idea of that there are so many possibilities in society where we can do shows mm -hmm. um, and not to wait for an invitation, but to just do it, you know? And, and the strange thing is that kind of almost never anybody said no. We kind of, and you know, and if they did say no, we tried again. But I mean, this sort of idea of convincing people was always, I always found that very exciting. Yeah, it's beautiful. Actually, I'm trying to make the connections starting, you started with Abi Warburg as kind of an initial inspiration. There was a patient um, of Binswangers close to your home. And he, in a way, also uh, represents like an ideal paradigm for how to deal with a very vast amount of visual content of the most diverse type and origin. And then at the same time, um, like him as an inspiration, there's also something like a moment of pattern recognition and a chain of reaction, which connects um, wonderfully to officially in Weiss no? and, and the work at Lauf der Dinge. And then obviously um, we haven't mentioned him yet or on indirectly the museum that you created in your room with all the postcards, the, as you call the imaginary museum is very much in, in line of the idea of the Musée Imaginaire von, of, of Malraux, no? like, which is again another interesting example of um, like a museum without walls that enacts somehow the displacement of the physical art object, no? Um, and, um, and the museum through like photographic reproduction. So I think that's in a way also something that continues in your work, also the way you use social media and, and books, et cetera. But kind of looking back at these, like this extremely prolific career of 30 years that however started small with 29 people in your uh, student apartment kitchen, um, what would you say looking back or looking at it now is kind of the red thread that connects all of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I suppose um, one kind of um, one thread, which definitely is, is always there, is this idea of, you know, finding other forms of engagement and, and go with art, you know, into society and, and not, I mean, I, you know, the thing is, for example, in London, we do these pavilions um, where we commission an architect every year to do a pavilion. And a couple of years ago, you know, I came back from a trip early one morning and I went to the gallery and um, like it's 7 a.m. or something and uh, uh, directly, you know, from the station. And um, and the taxi driver who dropped me um, said, you, you obviously work there because, you know, no one would kind of go to the Serpentine at 7 a.m. So I said, yes, yes. And he uh, wanted to tell me the story of his daughter, right? And he... He told me that they came to the park like the previous summer and his daughter all of a sudden ran into the pavilion uh, because obviously you know our pavilions i mean last, last year was by sumaya valley the youngest architect so far from counter space who created a kind of an archipelago because she created not only the pavilion but also a series of islands a series of you know smaller pavilions which she put in different communities so we felt quite a lot i mean initially it was about the scheme as it was set up by julia peyton johns my colleague was had to do with bringing international architects to London and opening up the discourse, you know, because like Zaha Hadid, with whom it started, or Sejima, or 
Niemeyer, as a matter of fact, or Gary, you know, had never built, you know, in the UK. But then over the last couple of years, we sort of changed the scheme and started to make it a scheme also for emerging younger architects like Frida Escobedo or Francis Kere, who is actually Berlin based. Or also, you know, Yunya Ishigami or, you know, last year, uh, the youngest architect uh, in the series, um, uh, Sumaya Valley with this, you know, archipelago structure. And obviously none of these pavilions have a door, so you can just walk in, you know, it's like free admission, it's in the park and so on. So basically he said his daughter, to come back to the taxi driver, you know, his daughter ran into the pavilion um, and he had to kind of get her to continue the walk and she had some kind of epiphany and he wanted to thank us because she's now obsessed and wants to start by architecture and wants to study architecture and had found a kind of a, you know, vocation. And I then asked him, you know, if he had visited also the galleries because, you know, we have free admission for like a million people a year and that's kind of, bottom line i mean you know it's kind of we we believe in that so to to have this you know the shows accessible for everyone but he said he wouldn't have visited the exhibition and i said i asked him why and then there was this kind of weird silence and after maybe about 30 seconds it felt very long you know the silence he said listen i i, I never thought museums are for people like us you know and so obviously if we wouldn't have gone you know with this um pavilion you know into the park and and no doors and so on and that's true for many of my shows you know that recently we did these poster shows where we ask 100 artists to come up with what they find is urgent for our time and we put these posters you know all over the world um so i think one kind of red thread is is definitely this idea you know to to find to kind of go with art into society and that means not only through exhibitions but i'm also very um um I'm very kind of convinced that we need to sort of work on this John Latham, Barbara Stavini idea of the APG, you know, sort of that, that the art displacement group, which uh, my friends Barbara Stavini and John Latham, who now both passed away, in the 60s designed as basically bringing artists at the table where decisions are being made. So they said, you know, every um, company, every corporation, and every government should, should have an artist in residence or should have a you know an artist on the board as a matter of fact and that's something i i also find like super interesting know how we can actually bring art through that you know into society and transform things to give you an example for that so i was telling you we do you know we did this little book remember nature um with, with artist instructions you know campaigns it's kind of a new version of my show do it where with costas basilopoulos and the back to earth thing you know we work we invited these artists to all develop a, a diy kind of you know um, a DIY uh, campaign. And one of the campaigns basically is, you know, Cooking Section, who uh, some of you will know who are this artist uh, collective working with uh, food and addressing, you know, the climate emergency through also the food crisis. And basically, uh, you know, um, uh, they wanted in the Serpentine to work with the restaurant. So we have Benugo as our partner in the restaurant, and uh, they are doing restaurants in loads of museums all over the uk they have dozens of restaurants and so we set up a contact you know a contact zone between the artist and the restaurant you know the ceo and owners of this restaurant and the directors and uh and basically um a whole you know uh, a whole collaboration started where now first of all salmon um which is not only toxic but also extremely environmentally detrimental, you know, was removed from the menus, um, not only of the Serpentine restaurant, but all the Benugo restaurants all over the UK. But, you know, it led to a collaboration where now this artist group cooking section do half of the menu of the restaurants of Benugo and came up with this climb of our, you know, dishes, you know, so all of a sudden an art project happens in dozens of restaurants all over the, you know, the UK. So basically that is certainly one Rota Faden, right? This idea of uh, thinking about art and, and society. I would say the second thing is that um, through curating, I've always believed that we can go, you know, beyond the, the, the fear of pooling knowledge. And, and I think that society um, is, is still, you know, very much divided into these different fields, um, particularly, you know, institutions. And that's at a moment when we have so many practices which are totally fluid, fluid between, you know, art, poetry, music, uh, architecture, design. Um, at that time, you know, very often 
the segregation in these different institutions. You know, you have an art institution, you have music context, you have or biennales, right? You have biennales for art, biennales for theater, or museums for all these different things. Um, so I always thought that we need um, platforms where all these different disciplines can come together. And I suppose, you know, a lot of my exhibitions have that in common. If it's Utopia Station, I'll do it, or Laboratorium, or, you know, Cities on the Move. But many of these shows try to address, or now back to Earth, as a matter of fact, our ecology project, you know, try to address big sort of topics of the 21st century by bringing in, you know, practitioners from all disciplines. Now, obviously, uh, the, the, the exhibition or the format of the exhibition um, ha has a great potential for this fluidity of practice because, um, to give you an example, you know, when we did Utopia Station in uh, 2003 with Rick Ritiravanit and Molly Nesbitt, um, and that's another thing which is maybe a rote of Arden, Lucas, to come back to your question, is that, you know, when, when I started, it was a time where there were like curators like Harald Seemann, in Switzerland, um, and they were mostly kind of like, you know, authors of exhibitions on their own. And I have never curated, I mean, almost never curated a show on my own. I'm not really interested in that. Uh, there has always been lots of collaborative constellations. I very often curate exhibitions with artists because I think, you know, a lot of the great creative and also game-changing exhibitions have been actually curated by artists, right? The Dada show, you know, in the uh, early 20th century in Berlin, or the Surrealist exhibition by Duchamp, or, you know, with, um, as told to me by Leonora Carrington, um, have all had very much the presence of artists kind of coming up with new rules of the game, right? How to actually do an exhibition, you know, in a sort of different way. And so that's why I would say, I mean, you know, I've curated an opera with Philip Pareno, I've curated Utopia Station with Rick Ritt, an artist, and with Maureen Nesbitt, an artist. So a vote of Arden, a red thread, is also these different constellations that all kind of my shows are collaborative. And to come back to sort of um, the interdisciplinarity or the kind of way of going beyond the field of pulling knowledge, I also find it really interesting how the exhibition allows us to do that, you know? So when we did Utopia Station, we, we wanted to invite filmmakers, artists, architects to think about this idea of, you know, of utopia. And of course, um, we, we kind of realized early on that there are, you know, major problems with this notion of, um, of, of utopia um, uh, as a kind of a static idea. And we were very inspired by uh, Eduard Liston. He's anyway kind of my, um, I mean, and maybe that's another thing my shows have in common is that I, I mean, I read every morning 15 minutes of, uh, of Eduard Lisson, and, uh, you know, based on that, I would say that Eduard Lisson is in the DNA kind of, of every show I, you know, of every show I do. And that's, I mean, mm. just done this little book, which is Tiny Tiny, which has just come out, which is um, all my conversations with Eduard uh, have been gathered, and also the drawings which he made during our conversation. So it's always, you know, the chapters are separated with these little uh, drawings. Uh, and it's a really interesting publishing house, which you should check out, which is um, uh, called Isolari, I-S-O-L-A-R-I-I. -I. I, I, I love what they do because they came up with this idea of doing these micro books. Um, and uh, the, it's like a subscription model. So they do like three, four, five a year. They did one with Kang Zue, the great Chinese novelist. Then they did one with Robert Coover, the American novelist, and Art Spiegelman illustrated it. Then they did one on Russian feminism, like an anthology. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's always the same format. These kind of micro, you know, sort of these micro books. And in a, in a way, you know, when I was talking before about different forms of distribution, inventing new circuits, you know, like for example with these books, it doesn't have an ISBN number but they printed like tens of thousands of copies and they find different ways of distributing it, you know? Uh, and I think that's something which, again, many of my shows has in, have in common, you know, that we find other circuits. And then I think, you know, unexpected kind of encounters, you know, to, I mean, when I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing I do besides, you know, reading him, reading Glisson for like 50 minutes, uh, is I, I always make a cyber introduction. I think, who are two people I know who should meet, who haven't met before? 
Um, and, you know, that very often produces exciting things, you know, like new friendships or new collaborations or exhibitions or, you know, all kinds of things come out of that. So, so in a way, I would say the junction making, the bringing together is of, of, uh, of unexpected encounters is another kind of waterfaden, a sort of a, a red, you know, thread. And of course, the exhibition allows us to, to do that in a way. So I've always felt very lucky to have that medium, you know. So for, to give you an example, and that's the last example I'm going to give, because it's a bit of a too long answer to your question. Uh, but the thing is, um, you know, we, for Utopia Station, we invited the filmmaker Anias Varda, right? And um, Anias Varda, one of the founders of the Nouvelle Vague, you know, one of the great filmmakers of the 20th century, or Oscar for her life achievement towards the end of her life. She was like in her 70s when I met her. Um, and I said, Anias, you know, I always felt that it would be exciting that you come, that you could experiment with exhibitions. And we invited her to Utopia Station. And you know, she spent her entire career as a filmmaker going to movie festivals. And when you're a filmmaker, you present your feature film, you know, in Venice or in Cannes or whatever. And then sometimes when you do a, a cool metrage, you know, a short film, it goes into a short film festival. But the, the number of outlets, you know, of formats are incredibly limited. It's, it's, very st it's very standardized, you know. You can either do a feature film or like a short film. So Anya's, you know, she was kind of saying, but what is this exhibition? I said, you know, it's a plateau. We have like, it's like mill plateau. We have this, you know, structure where we create, and then we plug in, you know, a bit like Peter Cook, the plug-in city. You can plug in all kinds of elements into this show, and you're totally free. So she said, but free, does it mean I can do whatever I want? I said, yeah, absolutely. We just have to connect to utopia and to a kind of a, a notion of utopia, which is not static, so not Plato or not Thomas Moore, you know, because they have utopia as a static system, but more the Glissantian idea of utopia as a tremblement, you know, kind of trembling utopia. Because, of course, you know, in fixed thought, as Glissant told us, um, all categories are imperial thought, you know, whilst we have to have the opposite. We need the all world trembles, you know, physically, geologically, mentally, spiritually, because the all world is looking for the point, uh, actually. Uh, where all the world's cultures, all the world's imaginations can meet and, and hear one another. And that's what we wanted with this show, right? We wanted to find the point where all the cultures can hear one another, listen to each other, um, and also change in a way through each other without losing their identity, but actually, you know, in the exchange with the other kind of, you know, be, um, become more complex. And so um, in this exhibition, Anies Vada suddenly did something she never did before. She disguised herself as a potato, so she made a potato costume, uh, and then uh, came to Venice as a potato, like, you know, it was like completely OMG. She kind of walked, she was in her 70s and walked through the Biennale, you know, as a potato. And then she did an installation with a lot of potatoes and sort of it was an exhibition called Pata Tutopia, right? It's a film of hers, multi-screen. And she says, you know, she felt like super liberated because she could never have done that in her world, right? This experiment. And then the last 15 years of her life, she never, you know, she didn't go that much to film festivals anymore. I mean, she won an Oscar, but she didn't go to film festivals that much anymore. She just did exhibitions, you know, all over the world. So just to say, you know, the exhibition gives us this freedom and possibility to bring people from all kinds of disciplines to experiment together. It's a very open format in a way. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for this kind of elaborate answer to that. And I remember um, an interview with you where you spoke about this kind of also change, game changer in your life, seeing, I don't know, I think it was Fish Levi's work, where you thought to yourself, how can I be useful to the arts? And that was really left a big impression on me, this question of how can I be useful? And I, I believe that you um, really very powerfully established the arts in the most widest sense of the world as a knowledge and reality generating practice. So there's a, a very powerful transformative power within the arts that I think is more, more relevant than, than ever uh, in these days. And it, it feels like this kind of cross fertilization of arts and culture and politics and technology and society is really, um, for me, kind of a red thread that I externally see, see in your practice. Um, 
I'm also really interested in um, methodologies. So how do people actually work? You know, like, for example, how does a lawyer file a case? How does a gallerist find an artist? An astrologist creates a horoscope, a music producer creates a song, you know, like a, a, a choreographer conceives a dance or an investor develops a business plan or how a curator comes up with an exhibition or a book. So like, what's your way of doing things? I think you kind of touched a lot upon this question already in your previous answers. But what's your method of operation when starting a project? I mean, the the beginning, yeah, it's a really interesting question because the beginning is always a conversation with you know with artists, and and in a way, it goes back again to me as a teenager, kind of traveling by night train, right? And so, um, one after Rosemary Trakel, one other early visit was to the late Alighiero Boetti, you know, the amazing artist in Rome. You might know his embroidered maps. Uh, which were made initially in Afghanistan and then in Pakistan. And um, that's just one of so many things, you know, Boiti did. And he, um, I arrived in Rome and, you know, he spent the day with me. He also brought me to his astrologer. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had dinner and we went to his studio in the, near the Pantheon. And, and Boiti kind of said, what are you going to do in life, you know? And, and I think, I mean, the thing is, what I find so interesting, and I suppose that's maybe also interesting for you, is, is this idea how mentorship can be, you know, important, how one conversation at the right moment in one's life can be so incredibly precious, you know, and and, uh, and if just someone who has a vision, you know, and a lot of experience uh, can give you one kind of advice, it can be like totally life changing, you know, and that's really what, what kind of I mean, I believe deeply in that. I believe in deeply in this idea kind of of, of mentorship. And, and kind of Boiti would spend the day with me and sort of find out what I was interested in and show me his work and stuff. And then, and then sort of we sat down for dinner and he said, you know, I'm now in my 50s and it's really like super irritating, he says, because I'm always invited to do the same shit, you know. It's always the same shit, he said. He basically... You know, my galleries ring and they want work for art fairs. I mean, at that time there were less art fairs, but already some. Uh, and then, you know, another gallery rings and wants a solo show, you know, and then a museum rings and wants a retrospective, you know, to look back. And then a Biennale rings and wants a new sculpture. And, uh, and then like a public art committee rings and they want the public art uh, work for their building. You know, and he says, I mean, obviously, you know, he wasn't arrogant about it because he says I'm really lucky, you know, to be successful and have all these requests, you know, because it could also be that the telephone wouldn't ring, you know. But at the same time, yeah, okay, so I'm lucky. But at the same time, it's also really depressing because um, nobody really wants to ever know what I want to do, you know. And, and that was really, for me, a super crucial moment. Because what he basically said is, he said, you know, you're so young, it could be your job, you could just go to artists and meet artists and ask them what nobody asks them, you know, what would you really want to do? And that, of course, you know, led to the to my main methodology, which is the methodology of the uh, of the unrealized project, right? Because I would always ask artists, you know, what is your unrealized project? What is your dream? What is the project you wanted always to do? And couldn't do, you know, within the parameters of the existing art world and of the existing structures, you know, in which you you operate. Now, the scope or the range of uh, of the unrealized is relatively wide. I mean, there are many different reasons why a project is unrealized. Either the project is too big to be realized, or the project is too expensive to be realized, or the project is, you know, unrealizable. Like when Stia Amajani wanted to um, connect the Earth with a sculpture to the Moon, I suppose that's, you know, more or less unrealizable. Um, and uh, I mean, physically connect the, you know, not to a satellite, like it would be a physical rod, you know, going from the Earth to the Moon. So these are unrealizable projects, that is utopic projects. Then there are also projects which are too small to be realized. Like Silo Mireles wanted to obviously do the Cruzeiro. He wanted to do like a little cube. Um, and that cube would be the museum. And so all the rest of the museum would need to be empty, right? And it took him a long time to find a museum 
which would agree to be completely empty and just have these little cubes. So that project was too small to be realized. Some projects are too expensive, but other projects are also, and I think that's very often a reason, um, they, they are too time intense to be realized because our life is kind of short, you know. I spoke to my friend Friederike Meyer, quite a great Austrian poet and writer, um, just before she died, she was like 96, I think, and she died last year. Um, and she told me, you know, she has at least another century of literature to write. So even if she was 96 years old, she had, she said, you know, I really would like to be 200 years old because I have another, I have ideas for another 100 years of novels and poems, you know. And so these projects are unrealized because there wasn't enough time. Like Ligeti, the composer, whom I knew, he was in Hamburg. He told me, you know, he was in his 70s. He told me I have another 50 years of music to write and I'm running out of time, you know. So that's a, very often is a reason, you know. And I think even in our lives, uh, you know, when not, not necessarily being old, but like being somehow in the middle of the life, you know, you have one, we, or being very young, we all have projects we would want to do, but we're just too busy, right? We don't have the time to do certain projects. You know, I always wanted to write a novel, but I just never had the time to, I mean, I wrote like six pages and then I never had the time, right? I mean, these projects which are too time intense and we don't have the time. Then mm. another reason why a project is unrealized uh, can of course be uh, censorship. Um, and we shouldn't forget that in, in many different contexts, there is censorship. And then as uh, Doris Lessing always told me, there is also um, self-censorship. I think we, many, many people have projects they would want to do, but they don't dare to do, you know, like super daring stuff uh, or dangerous stuff, as Doris Lessing said, right? So these are sort of self-censor projects, you know, and very often there is a good reason not to do them. So, you know, some of these projects are better, better remain unrealized. Uh, and then, you know, others might be interesting to be realized. So, so like, it's just like a very wide range of, um, of, of the unrealized. And I would always ask artists about these projects. And that often gives us ideas of what we can do, you know, so that we then, I, I kind of, you mentioned before this idea of being useful, you know, I, one way of being useful is to help artists to realize these kind of unrealized projects. So that's part of the methodology. Um, I would say, just to have conversations with artists is part of the methodology. I think also, you know, to another part is that to be kind of an eternal student is kind of part of my methodology. And I, I kind of think, you know, like when I, when I, I mean, this is kind of now really interesting, maybe in relation to also uh, Germany, because when, when I was, when I had done my kitchen show, you know, I then based on the kitchen show, I received the grant from the Cartier Foundation. So I could leave Switzerland for the first time for longer. Um, so the kitchen show kind of opened so many doors because it kind of became a rumor. Uh, and then I met Kaspar Koenig, uh, the you know great German impresario and curator, and he invited me to kind of collaborate with him. And uh, and then like you know all of a sudden, what started as a really intimate and also relatively kind of small project, and I was kind of shy and did this project in my kitchen. All of a sudden, within a fortnight, you know my activity had become really public. And Kasper Koenig and I worked at a painting show and on a book and I came to Frankfurt and I worked with him at the Schädelschule and my whole activity was very, very public, you know, and uh, and media and newspaper interviews and press and so on. And so it was kind of like a shock because I had no, you know, I had no experience how to handle that and so on. And so then like one evening, I, I was kind of a little bit, I mean, it was a sort of a slightly tricky moment because I was somehow on the brink, you know, of a, uh, of a nervous breakdown because it was all too much. Uh, and then I, I never forget, like one evening we were in the in the kitchen of Thomas Bayerle, you know, one of the greatest teachers ever, the, you know, the great uh, artist, um, kind of pioneer of pop art in Germany and based in Frankfurt. And very early on, did work, you know, related to the internet and new media, and he's really an incredible pioneer. Um, and so Thomas Bayerle kind of sat me down in his kitchen, uh, and he said, you know, it's all fine. He said because at the end of the day. You just need to have a garden, you know. You always need to have a garden where you can go when it becomes too stressful, and uh, you can, you know, have these other activity, you know, outside the art world. And that's kind of when I realized what could be my methodology. Uh, so to never be kind of stuck and to never, you know, uh, be overwhelmed, which would be because I anyway had always this curiosity. I didn't really, you know, 
need a garden, but my garden could be a knowledge garden because I was a curiosity for other fields. And so then I thought like, wow, I could just somehow go into the architecture world because I was really curious about architecture and I could do the same I did in the art world and I could become a student again and just make visits with architects, you know? And then I would just ring up all these architects. And then once I had finished this, you know, it became part of my practice. I was, you know, curating art and architecture. I started to do the same with science. So for about three years, I would go to laboratory of scientists, you know, all over the world. And I would make, you know, instead of studio visits, I would make science lab visits. And then uh, another period later, I realized that, you know, I, I really needed to meet, to, to bring literature into my exhibition. Um, and, and so I started to visit poets and, and writers, you know, Doris Lessing or Han Pamuk. I would ring them up and, you know, make studio visits with writers. I mean, mostly just go to their apartment and talk about their work. And so the, 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 the methodology was always the same. You know, I became again the teenager who would be curious and find out and learn, right? And that process never really stopped. You know, I'm now doing it with technology. Um, and uh, about five or six years ago, a friend of mine said a kind of shocking that I know nothing about fashion, you know? So then uh, I started to kind of visit a lot of fashion designers from Rei Kawakubo to Yamamoto and did that whole research. And, you know, little by little, it then all enters kind of my exhibition. So I would say the methodology is kind of infinite curiosity and also to be an eternal student in a way, because obviously also whenever you go into a field, you know, it all starts from scratch again. One has to read. I mean, one of the things is also, I realized that the more busy one gets, the less one reads, right? But then whenever, you know, I need to go and, interview and I used the interview a lot for that you know so for example when I wanted to find out more about music I got myself hired as a, a reporter for Numero you know to basically do interviews with pop stars and musicians uh, and obviously they loved the idea because you know all these musicians and pop stars they always ask the same questions you know in their field so they loved this idea that all of a sudden somebody from another field would come and ask them about Utopia, about unrealized projects, you know, weird questions they've never been asked before. So then, you know, I, I started to do that series. And so, so in a way, um, it's, I would say that's another sort of part of the, of the methodology. Um, I mean, the other one is of course, to, to do specific, you know, uh, research into depths in certain geographies, you know, I would always spend time in cities I've never been and just go to dozens of studios um, and uh, yeah, I would say these are a couple of sort of, you know, rats, rats in terms of the research and the methodology. Thank you so much for sharing this. And you just mentioned um, this moment when you started working with Kaspar Koenig and you became for the first time, maybe a bit more of a public figure. And this leads me to another question about publicity and actually on, and the usage of media because um, you're um, and a very prolific use of different media in your curatorial practice is actually quite exceptional, no? Your, your means of communication range from conversations just like this, lectures, conferences, I remember these 24-hour marathons, to other books, exhibitions, films, and social media as well, no? You use um, also in particular Instagram really in a way, and now we're coming, connecting back to Abi Warburg and actually Molro, it's like the little imaginary museum that you're creating there. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about these different medias and also the unique possibilities that are inherent to these various media. Yeah, I mean, I always kind of uh, was sort of slow in using them because I didn't really know at the beginning, you know, what to, to do with it. Um, I, I kind of always disliked Facebook, so from the very, very beginning, so I never engaged with that. But I was kind of fascinated by Instagram. Um, and um, again, it sort of all began with an artist because I was in LA with Ryan Tricartin. And obviously, Ryan Tricartin was one of the, you know, was one of the first artists to really engage with the internet, also in terms of filmmaking and in terms of the collective, you know, his sort of collective practice. I mean, now he kind of, he moved to the countryside and is building this garden, you know, and all of that. But at that time, in the, you know, maybe 15 years ago, Ryan, you know, was working a lot with sort of internet kind of inspired films with groups of, of, uh, of his friends. And Instagram played a very big role in that. And so we were having breakfast in LA and he downloaded uh, the app 
on my phone. He asked if he could do it, and I said yes. And so he downloaded the Instagram app on my phone, and uh, and then he sent a message to all his followers. And as he was an early adopter of Instagram, he had quite a lot of followers then. Uh, and he sent a message to all his followers, basically, um, yeah, um, telling them that I had joined Instagram. And then I didn't really know what to do with it. And I mean, I think. Um, what I'm now going to say has goes also back, Lucas, to your previous question about the methodology, because, you know, ultimately, I suppose I'm kind of a flaneur of some sort. It has a lot to do with uh, being a flaneur because, or, uh, you know, going on walks in a way, you know, I mean, I do it all the time in real life, but it's also an online, but it's also metaphorically going on a walk. I mean, I kind of come from Robert Walser, you know, the, uh, the, the, the legendary Swiss writer who ended up not writing anymore, but just going on endless walks. And there's this beautiful book. If you haven't read it, it's my favorite book ever. It's by Carl Selig and it's called Spaziergänge. You know, it's walks with Robert Walser, Spaziergänge with Robert Walser. And it's about his endless walks, you know, with Walser, this great, you know, writer. Um, and so I think in a way, in this sort of Flannery principle, there is also quite a lot of, you know, chance involved, or it's maybe control chance, I don't know. And that's really how we came to this Instagram thing. So I, I mean, I knew what I didn't want. I mean, I, I knew that I didn't kind of want to, you know, use it, um, you know, to photograph my food or selfies or all of that stuff. I wanted it to have a kind of um, um, a purpose, no? A you uh, maybe yeah, to be useful to art and, and at the same time to society. And almost like I was thinking, like, it would be great if my Instagram could be a kind of a movement, no? It's kind of like. Uh, that there is a certain urgency to it that I have to do it, and there is a sense, no. And then I, but for a long time I didn't know what to do with it, and um, and then I went to see Umberto Eco, the late Umberto Eco in uh, in Milano, and it was a really inspiring visit. You know, he uh, of course he's famous for his book, The Name of the Rose. You know, and if you've read it, there's this famous you know library there. Um, and that's how his house looked like. It was kind of like a crazy library, endless library. And there was a room where only he had the key. So then, you know, he took the key out of his pocket. He stuffed in the key and he opened this room and took me to this, you know, inner sanctum of his book world where he had all these medieval books, handwritten books and so on. And whilst we looked at it, uh, he started to kind of, talk about the disappearance of handwriting and calligraphy. And he said, you know, again, he gave me a task. You know, it's a kind of weird thing that still like later on, our current was given these tasks. And he said, you should really do something about handwriting and doodling because it sort of disappears in the digital age. And um, I mean, now it's digitally a bit more present because we have stylos on tablets, but you know, at the beginning, because Steve Jobs was kind of, you know, and, and particularly also the, the whole Apple thing was about having one object, so there were no stylos. Um, so the whole sort of doodle thing wasn't really present. And uh, yeah, Echo was kind of worried that handwriting disappears. And then, uh, you know, I, I sort of, he said one should do calligraphy courses. So then I kind of left his house and I, you know, it didn't really occur to me anything more. I just forgot about it. I continued my life. I transcribed the interview. I mean, I obviously remember the yeah, handwriting, handwriting. And uh, and then I was on holidays with my partner, Kushonga, the artist, and also with two other artists, uh, Simon Fatal and Etel Annan, the poet and artist. Uh, and we were like in, in Bretagne at the beach. And all of a sudden kind of started to rain like heavily. And we needed to find protection or shelter in a cafe. And it, the rain was just endless as it happens, you know, in Brittany. It never stops once it starts raining. And then after about two or three hours, you know, I took my phone and I started to answer some emails. So did Simone and crew, but obviously Etel, who was in her 90s, didn't have a, a phone, but she took her notebook and started to handwrite the beautiful poem. And that's when suddenly, you know, I had the epiphany because I thought like, wow, you know, I'm meeting artists every day and poets every day. If I would just post like their handwriting, you know, I asked them to write a sentence or a doodle, mostly a sentence, and then I film it or I photograph it. And so that became you know, the beginning kind of of my Instagram. And then later on, of course, I added studio visits. And also um, I realized, you know, again, you know, we were, there was art and technology conference um, and and we were there with, actually with, there was Hito Steyl, there was Ben Vickers, Ian Chang, and we are having lunch, you know, it was at Google and uh, Culture Institute. 
we were having lunch and all of a sudden, you know, I was asking again the artists to do these post-its. And Ben Vickers said, this is really boring. You have been doing this like for many years now. Why don't you go back to surrealism, you know, because the surrealists had this game when you have a piece of paper, you know, you fold it um, in four parts and it's a very nice game to play. And then the first part, somebody makes a head and then, you know, you turn it and then the next person draws the second part up and then you unfold it, you know. The famous game, Breton, the Surrealist, where at Oppenheim and others, you know, played. So then, actually, I happened the next day to meet Nanos Valauritis, the last kind of sort of surviving Surrealist of this circle of Breton, the Greek Surrealist. And he told me the whole story of this exquisite corpse. And then we started to do these exquisite corpse. So whenever I'm with three or four artists, you know, we would do um, exquisite corpse game and I would publish that on, you know, on Instagram. And then obviously, you know, it went on and on and on and like it kept evolving. And then at a certain moment, everybody started to ask me, you know, what are you doing with TikTok? And uh, and then as I started to wonder TikTok and I started to follow, you know, a lot of artists on TikTok. I mean, it's, for example, really interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you'll hear about that also when you meet Candice, but what Candice Williams did, you know, politically, you know, with TikTok was like super fascinating. And uh, and at the same time, you know, also if you look at uh, Jeremy or Harris, how you know what 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 Jeremy kind of compiles these TikTok things and then puts it on Instagram. And so I was following a lot of people on Instagram, and again I didn't know you know what to do. And then um, actually during the the lockdown, the extreme lockdown in London, when the only thing we could do was to go on walks in the park, um, I had the idea of what to do with uh, the TikTok. And uh, I started to, I mean, that's a more, you know, playful thing. It's not as, I mean, the Instagram is really a movement and it will lead now to exhibitions and books about this whole handwriting project. The TikTok thing is more playful and um, maybe a bit less serious, but we started to basically do this project with TikTok where I would um, every day, you know, interview animals in the park. So that has been, uh, so in a way, there isn't a kind of a master plan. These things kind of happen, they fall into place and particularly with Instagram, you know, but it always happens through conversations. And it's beautiful. Also nice that you mentioned, um, as you just mentioned, Candice Williams, who will be here on Monday. And actually, the she was the reason that I started getting into TikTok because I realized, wait, there's, this is quite a dialogical format. Maybe like compared, like Instagram seems almost one dimensional com uh, compared to TikTok. And there's also um, a certain like political urgency. But I also love um, the that you started Instagram with an almost anachronistic movement by like bringing back the handwriting. No, it's like almost an antithesis to the disillusioning of, of, of handwritings. But I was um, also inspired by, um, before we officially started, we said our uh, common friend, Schumann Bazaar, at his birthday today, you um, um, edited a book, The Age of Earthquakes, and a follow-up book with him and uh, Douglas Copeland. Um, which I read as um, like an, a translation of Marshall McLuhan's Medium is the Message in the, into the kind of contemporary times, um, almost like a Medium is the Message or Massage 2.0. Um, and then obviously also another um, connection that I made to your practice with regards to media and the usage of media is your 89 plus project where, and correct me if, you, if I'm wrong, but where you started looking in particular at a younger generation of artists that are born 89 and, 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 and younger, because this was a pivotal year where not only the kind of Iron Curtain fell and the fall of the Berlin Wall, but also the, the birth of the World Wide Web in, in CERN by, by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, yeah, so maybe you can say a few words about this too. Yeah, so we um, uh, basically at the supper time, at some point, I would say, um, it's actually, again, you know, it sort of happened through a conversation. I was in um, uh, in Marrakesh giving a talk at the TED conference and, uh, you know, late at night, it was probably 12 years ago or something like that. There was a kind of an event um, and then a party and I had a conversation with um, John Nash from London and he explained to me that there is this whole, you know, new generation of artists in London who work, you know, with the internet and it, how weird he finds it that institutions like museums are not at all addressing it, you know, and that they have no tech department, et cetera, et cetera. 
So he said that it's a kind of a group and it involves uh, Dean Kizik and Ed von Yeles, and, you know, Ben Vickers and several other people. Uh, and, you know, a whole world I wasn't familiar with in London. Uh, so I said, you know, let's meet this group um, as soon as we are back in London. Uh, and so we arranged a coffee and, you know, and I kind of realized it's the first time I met Ben Vickers. Uh, and I kind of realized that that's really missing in an institution like the Serpentine. You know, there isn't like a tech department. Um, I mean, there is a website, but there isn't really, you know, research made with technology. And so we, I kind of went to the office the next day and I said, you know, we need to, Higher Ben Vickers. We need, you know, we need a technology curator in in the organization, and uh, and that really was the beginning of our, um, you know, of our kind of tech, tech department. You know, Ben later became then the CTO, and then we we you know we build a whole team um, of five or six people, you know, who who do research in relation to technology, to you know, to AI, um, uh, to blockchain, um, and um, and obviously, you know, I kind of we realized through that that institutions need kind of new new um, new departments, no? Because if you look at, at most museums, you know, there isn't a tech department, but there also isn't an ecology department. And we worked a lot with Gustav Metzger, who addressed the extinction crisis with our marathon. Because as you mentioned, we have this format, which if you want to know more, you can see on the website of the Southern, which are our marathons. So There's a whole archive thing. We did one on extinction with Gustav about 10 years ago. Uh, and there was another one, you know, more recently with also kind of our whole technology research about AI, the growth, the gas, the horse and the machine. And that then led to a, um, um, a marathon we did about the future of work also, you know, in, in the digital age, in the age of AI, what's happening with work uh, and AI. And so obviously that meant, you know, new departments had to be created in in the institution. Uh, and uh, we, we also, we said, Gia Pietro Justi, uh, built an ecology department, you know, so we, after having done the ecology marathon with Gustav Metzger, we felt it's important to have a whole, you know, ecological, you know, department in an organization. Uh, I mean, now more museums do that as well, but at that time it didn't exist. We felt it's urgent. And then with Amar Khalaf, we have a civic curator, you know, where we basically bring curating into communities. For example, we have this Parking Dagenham Radio Ballads project where artists work in the community with caretakers, you know, in in Barking Dagenham and produce work there. So civic curation, ecology, technology, you know, new departments were created at the Serpentine. And that allowed us to kind of work in an even more, you know, interdisciplinary way. And we, for example, in 2018-19, you know, we invited the late Bernard Stiglow to, um, um, to, do, to do this marathon with us about work. And uh, for the future of work, you know, all, all departments work together because, of course, ecology matters for that. Technology with AI making partially work disappear, and then, of course, also the civic aspect. And as a result, you know, of that marathon, uh, we wrote actually with the Serpentine a letter. With, with, it's one of the last projects of Bernard Stiegler. It's this letter to um, uh, Antonio Gutierrez, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations. You know, uh, and it was basically a, a letter. Um, uh, about, uh, uh, maybe I can quote here, um, uh, to, to actually implement, you know, ideas of Marcel Mauss um, into the United Nations, uh, because Mauss mentioned this idea of intonation, a dynamic according to which nations could be called upon to cooperate without erasing their local, you know, dimensions. And of yeah. course, that's super relevant because it means, you know, how can we be local you know, without being localist. And I mean, we live in a in a context where I mean, COVID has exacerbated that, where we have, you know, more and more nationalisms, you know, localisms, um, and uh, a kind of a, a refusal of, of, uh, of co you know, not only of cooperation, but of solidarity. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that means we, you know, uh, the words of Ete Latnan are more urgent than ever when she says, you know, the world needs togetherness, not separation, love, not suspicion, a common future, not isolation. And that's exactly what we want to achieve with all these projects, you know, to contribute to togetherness, not separation, to love, not suspicion, and to a common future, not, you know, not isolation. And I think in a way that also brings up the question of the local, you know, I think for anybody who works now, um, you know, as an artist, as a curator, if it's an institution or if it's outside the institution, 
you know, we all need to somehow address the question of the local. And uh, uh, and I think again, Edouard Lisson is uh, very helpful for that uh, and a great toolbox. I really do believe that Edouard Lisson is the great writer for the 21st century um, because of you know all these incredible tools he gave us about you know the right to opacity, creolization, mondialité. So this idea of not the homogenized globalization, but also not the counter reaction of new local, new localisms, but the global dialogue which listens. But then last but not least, because of his incredibly deep reflection on the local, because he says, uh, and that's something Mantia Diavara summarized beautifully, the Glissantian idea of being rooted in one's country or one's culture being important. But, you know, it's only important to be rooted as long as it does not lead to the exclusion or annihilation of other people's roots. And it's only important as long as it does not lead to the hierarchization and election of some roots and cultures over others. And that's why Glissant teaches us that we need to celebrate roots that expand elsewhere, roots that touch each other. Uh, and so these are not singular roots, but these are roots that cover, you know, and protect some other. And I think that's a really, you know, interesting definition of uh, the local and brings us back to this idea of, you know, Stiegler's question, comment peut on être local sans être localiste? You know, how can we be local without, uh, without being localist? And so kind of wrap up, you know, the answer to your question about, you know, about technology, um, the marathons often addressed that and brought together. We also, at some point we started to do commissions in the, we, we also did the 89 plus with Simon Caste, so that was a mapping of the generation, you know, born with the internet, and we did a, a whole marathon on that and, and exhibitions. But also, we started to do solo shows um, at the Serpentine, where basically experiments with art and technology became center stage. You know, so for example, we did the first show with Ian Chang uh, in London, where we launched Bar, where you know we had an AI creature born, you know, at the Serpentine and take over as a solo show. Um, or we worked on a project with Pierre Week, you know, about AI. Or we worked on a project with Sandra Perry, which had a lot to do with, uh, Lucas, your question also about Tim Berners-Lee, because of course, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989, and I've interviewed him several times, and you know, he is on a crusade now to save the internet, because he says the internet has turned into the opposite of what he wanted it to be, because of course, the motto was always that this is for everyone, yeah, right? And I mean, he says now there is a risk of a fast internet for people who pay and a slower internet for people who can't afford to pay. And he wants to sort of save this idea of, uh, the, you know, the World Wide Web being for, for everyone. And that's exactly what Sandra Perry does, you know, with her amazing digital work, which is open source uh, and can be, you know, can be used by everyone. So I would say, you know, Billy Kluwer in the 60s did the experiments with you know art and technology and that's of course also connected to the book you look as you showed which we did with Schumann whose birth date is today Schumann Bazaar and also um, with uh, Douglas Copeland and and that's of course uh, a book which revisits the Marshall McLuhan you know paperback and tries to kind of define also the paperback as a group show we invited a lot of artists to kind of you know, do, you know, do, do pages for it. Uh, so it's basically not only a, a book of writing, but it's also a, an illustrated kind of group show, uh, book imminent, you know, kind of, kind of group show. And it's interesting that, you know, at the time when McLuhan um, wrote about technology, Billy Kluwer in the 60s did these experiments with art and technology where he brought artists and engineers from Bell Laboratories, you know, together. And so if they called it the experiments in art and technology, we felt, you know, we need in in our time kind of new new experiments from uh, new experiments in art and technology. It kind of goes from eat to to need. Thank you. And actually, I would like to pick up um, on the localism or the, the local that you just mentioned of the connection to uh, Glissant. Um, and I think um, what you said, like his understanding, was more of more than a rhizomatic understanding. No, kind of quite quite in the line of, of Deleuze and Guattari. And also defining identity as not something that relates to a source of origin, but rather to a 
like a poetics of relation. Um, um, um. But um, another question that I had um, with regards to places, um, we have discussed here quite often also Donna Haraway and her concept of situated knowledges, also to argue that the perception of any situation is always a matter of an embodied located subject and their kind of geographical and historical specific perspective no? as a perspective also constantly being structured and restructured by the current conditions and situations so how far do you think does your lifestyle of living and working in many different places right now you're in zurich you're going to be in london soon before you were in paris so constantly traveling the world speaking many different languages how did this kind of shape your personal and your professional trajectory as a kind of real personification of the mondialité, so to speak. I mean, I suppose it has a lot to do with, you know, um, spending time, you know, in places. It's actually, you know, um, uh, I would say, I mean, I lived 15 years in Paris. I, you know, I've now lived 16 years in London. Um, and I've learned a lot, you know, from these cities. They have been kind of like my school. And, uh, and I think in a way, also when I, when I travel, I mean, I try to sort of, I think this idea of short trips is really not productive. You know, I think um, the idea of spending, you know, longer periods in cities um, and make, you know, and make research has, um, has always been what is, you know, what is most, what is most productive. So, so it's kind of in a weird way, sort of slow traveling rather than, you know, rather than fast traveling. I think the other thing um, it, it of course that it has to do very often sort of in my research with people, no, because I, I would visit, you know, artists in cities and then artists would kind of introduce me to other artists and um, and it would sort of become, um, you know, it would become a conversation. And I would say for me, cities are, uh, you know, in that sense, you know, conversations. But I think I always find it interesting how within the cities um, or within every city actually, very often fields, I mean, it goes back to what we discussed a bit earlier, you know, fields don't really talk to each other. And very often, you know, we, um, people actually who live in the same city and work in different fields or different disciplines have never really met. And that's why I've always been interested in kind of when I'm in a city to come up with formats to bring people together, you know, so that can be the marathon, but that can also be, um, that can also be like, sort of via the formats like the Brutally Early Club, you know, we started to do this club, actually with Schumann and uh, Mark Thiessen um, in the early 2000s, where we would arrange meetings at six o'clock in the morning. And uh, um, it worked in most cities, but it didn't work in Berlin because I don't think people want to get up at 6 a.m. in Berlin. So for whatever reasons, it, it weirdly didn't work in Berlin. Um, but in most other cities, like a lot of people showed up like at 6 a.m. And it, you know, created weird kind of encounters in sort of um, ever-changing places. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've always tried to come up with formats, you know, where we can bring people in a way, you know, together um, who otherwise wouldn't, um, who otherwise wouldn't meet. And that's, of course, also to do with traveling. You know, when I come to cities, I try to kind of do that in, you know, in different cities. And talking about bringing people together and kind of conversations, um, I mean, this 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 whole course is kind of about kind of bringing across that, like the, the 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 problems that we're facing globally right now can absolutely not be tackled by a single profession. But you know, we have to sit together uh, at a round table. Um, but um, you also said earlier that you basically never did an exhibition totally by yourself, but always in collaboration with others. So what has your, um, what has been your biggest learnings regarding such collaborative creative processes as the junction maker you are? Do you mean from whom have I learned most? Or no, from which situation? More, like what's your biggest co learning in collaboration? Because that's an, it's an art form in itself, you know, it does not naturally work. Yeah, I suppose um, that's very sort of, you know, it's situative. It sort of changes in a way from from project to project, I would say. But I think um, that with each of these um, with each of these collaborations, 
it's also, you know, becoming familiar with different methodologies of working, because as you said, you know, we all, I mean, everybody has their own kind of methodology, you know, of working, and there is a kind of a risk that we keep repeating them, you know, and I would say that with each uh, of these collaboration, it's kind of also getting out of the comfort zone of one's own kind of methodology and finding a kind of a, a middle ground of, you know, the methodology of the people one collaborates with in some kind of way, you know, and uh, I would say that that's, um, that led to, you know, um, to many, um, you know, to many new formats, uh, ideally. I mean, one example would be when we did, uh, you know, cities on the move with, with Wuhan rule, right? Because I mean, I my methodology had a lot to do with, um, in a way, thinking about. I mean, that's maybe also something I forgot to mention before, which like a lot of my exhibitions have in common, is that I try to sort of avoid top-down curating and sort of bring in bottom-up moments, you know, because obviously curating often has to do with a master plan, you know. So, and I mean that has to do with you and my friend Lucas Jona Friedman. Um, you know, who basically talked about uh, a lot about self-organization, you know, in relation to cities. Um, and I think it's interesting. I mean, I sort of brought a lot of these Freeman theories or Freeman practices into my curatorial practice and, and wanted to come up with sort of, you know, possibilities where shows can, you know, um, can have self-organized zones where the curator isn't not just the authority who makes a checklist and decides, you know, what's in and out, but the curator kind of you know enables self-organized zones and so yeah and then Han Ru came up with this idea of a post-planning condition which he was interested in in relation to you know in relation to China and in a way we clearly came up with a format of an exhibition there which none of us could have done alone you know um it sort of was a combination of his and my methodology you know in a way uh I mean, that was one, one, you know, one example. And then when we worked on Utopia Station, you know, with Rick Reed, uh, and Molly, Molly obviously had a very different sort of methodology as an art historian, right? And so she wanted this to be also theory. And so we started to kind of, you know, work with Etienne Baliba, you know, work with Lisson, work with many theoreticians, you know, on this show. Um, and uh, it sort of created a sort of a whole, I would say, discursive platform, which is almost like a parallel reality to the physical platform we created, you know, with Rick Reed. And again, something came out which none of us would have created, you know, on on their own. And at the end of the day, it's kind of difficult also to say who did what, you know, but it clearly leads to things, you know, uh, which um, in widen or um, in a way, you know, uh, complexify a methodology. You know, yeah. What I've done on my own. I would say the other thing which um, can be said, you know, about about that, about this idea of of collaboration, that very often these collaborations are are ongoing, you know, over many years. So they're not just kind of like, you know, one-offs. They're kind of like longer, uh, you know, they're longer dialogues. Often they go, you know, over 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 an entire lifetime, you know, over 10, 20 years somehow. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, particularly grateful for you sharing kind of all your inspirations and all your mentors no, during our conversation now, because I find this quite interesting also to understand that nothing happens in a vacuum, no? that kind of whatever we do in a way is also a, a link and in an infinite chain of, of contributions and reflections that are happening and that will continue to happen. Um, and um, speaking of inspiration, quite frankly, I mean, you are a huge inspira inspiration influence also for myself. and um, I very much admire your like restless curiosity. You mentioned that earlier yourself, no? And this incredible uh, ability that you have to use this curiosity to build alliances, you know, and bridges between places and people that were maybe disconnected before. So really understanding the curator as a connector, an enabler, and translator, a catalyst. Um, and another huge influence I have to say is that I mean, apart from the fact that all the students will be buying over a, a glissant um, after the session. Um, actually, I was introduced to Edouard Clisson also via you, via an interview that I read, and you, um, you've been mentioning him for, for many, many, many years. And, um, and in a way, his kind of notion of what he, he calls Clisson the archipelagic thinking, also the thinking in the archipelago, you, you mentioned it also before, or the thinking of ambivalence and in ambivalence and 
contrast to what he calls the continental or like system thinking is actually a major driving force my, for, for my entire practice as well. And for this lecture series too, no? to explicitly embrace ambivalence, incoherence and, and contradiction. Um, coming come towards, towards the end, I have two more questions for you. And the, the um, first one is um, that I always like to address more like the, the hardship as well in, these, uh, uh, in this series kind of the dark side of the creative process um, that also naturally comes along in actually in any profession, discipline and career. So looking back and at your undoubtedly unique and absolutely outstanding career, there must have been also many moments of frustration or disillusionment or disappoint, uh, disappointment. How do you, have you dealt or how, how do you deal with such, such setbacks in, in your life? Um, yeah, I mean, to finish on, Actually, Lisa, just from what you said before, I mean, Lisa is the best answer to your question about what we learn from collaborations, you know, in a way, because of course, his whole thing is about the archipelago. And it's also so interesting that he wanted to do a museum as a, when he was a, you know, as a philosopher, he wanted to build a museum. And he says, archipelic thought makes it possible to say that neither each person's identity not a collective identity, are fixed and established once and for all, I can change through the exchange with the other without losing or diluting my sense of self. Um, and it's archipelic thought that teaches us this. And I think that that's the key thing of collaboration, you know, that we can change through the exchange with the other without losing or diluting a sense of self, in a way. Um, so maybe that sort of nails that. Um, uh, quite, I mean, better than anyone could somehow explain it, certainly better than I could explain it in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say frustrations. I already mentioned one example, you know, the kind of thing with Thomas Bayerle, what he taught me in the kitchen, that we need these gardens, you know, and whenever I'm, you know, in a way, when a project, you know, obviously, you know, as a curator, one has a lot of projects which are unrealized, you know, because basically um, sometimes there isn't the budget or sometimes, um, I mean, for all the reasons I told you, projects are unrealized, you know, I have projects for all these categories, you know, and that can sometimes be frustrating. And uh, for me, whenever that happens, I just, you know, make a studio visit or visit a scientist or a poet and, um, and basically um, all is well again, you know, so um, and I mean, I would say, particularly over the last sort of 10, 15 years, uh, I saw almost every month the poet Etel Adnan uh, in Paris, the Lebanese poet who passed away last year. Um, and she really has been sort of almost like an oracle for me. And whenever I had, you know, uh, disappointments or things, you know, I any kind of conversation with her gave so much hope, you know. So uh, I would say also... Um, one thing which is, is also kind of important is the, the sort of long duration sort of perspective, you know, is, is kind of a way to go beyond disappointments when things don't, sometimes don't work out or are really, really difficult. Because I think um, it's really important to think about the fact, you know, that, um, I mean, Roman Katanik talks about how to be a good answer in his book, and he says that, um, you know, a lot of our current sort of society frame has to do with short termism, you no? Know? And very often deadlines and all of that, you know, have to do with short termism. And he says we need to think about more about longer durational projects. You know, and if you think about, I mean, a project like Do It, which I've been doing, has had lots of highs and lows, you know, um, and but it has been going on for 30 years, you know, and it has never stopped. And so if we do projects which are not just one-offs, but if we work on a project for 20, 30 years, you know, it can move across waves and there are highs and there are lows, there are intervals, there are pauses, there are silences. So I think one of the things also is really important for me is to kind of work on things, you know, which have a sort of a long, you know, a long durational dimension. And that's a way of, you know, of not being disappointed in anything because you always, you see it in that bigger sort of, uh, in that bigger in that bigger framework and of course i mean one thing i think which is, is always difficult is of course that um 
it very, it's very, very difficult in terms of what I said before, the APG thing that we really want to bring out into society, because very often that goes, you know, very slowly. And so then, you know, that can be frustrating. Mm. Um, and now I want to pick up on another practice that you mentioned before, that of ritual. So within this um, course, juxtaposition, we have this ritual that after each um, conversation, after each talk, the, the students, they keep like a personal journey or logbook of kind of what remained with them, what inspired them about the the, um, the talk or the conversation. And it's really been a, like a this repeating thing. Once a week, we sit down, we talk, we hear a completely new perspective, and then we write these things down. And one of uh, a, a, a ritual within the ritual is that um, as the kind of very last uh, and final question, I always ask each speaker, um, for, advi for advice, and you've actually gathered an amazing compendium so far. It could be a book in itself. So now it's your turn, Hans Ulrich. Um, what piece of advice could you give all the becoming artists, designers, musicians, architects, fashion designers, etc., etc., listening to um, to you today? Yeah, I mean, it's a question I often ask also, you know, in my conversations, because of course, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote the wonderful book, which is an advice to a young poet. So my advice would always be to read that book. Uh, you know, and I'm sure you've already done that as part of this course, because if that's the theme, then that's the kind of key book, no? But that's definitely an advice, is to kind of always read and reread that book. Um, I think the other advice is... Um, is kind of what I said maybe already is about the mentor, you know, is to find mentors. Um, I think it's really, it's really an important thing in, in every, you know, in every practice. And I know that from artists who always tell me how important that was for them, you know, at the beginning of their trajectory, you know, to, to have, you know, to have mentors. Um, I think the other, the other advice is also um, to really think about uh, the infinite possibilities there are, you know, to to produce reality and not just, you know, go where everybody else goes, which is obviously, you know, the formats we I mentioned earlier, you know, like exhibitions in museums or galleries or art fairs or biennales, you know, but actually to think about all the other possibilities there are in society to kind of produce reality and have a sort of a DIY approach to that and, uh, uh, and find you know new find new forms of uh, of engagement maybe one could say or new forms of uh, um, yeah new forms of of, uh, of also commitment. I think the other thing is that um, is that lo long durée thing. You know, I think it's really important to to find projects um, which are not related to a deadline or which are not related to a specific you know project but which we we do you know throughout our life which are always there you know and which we can continue to let evolve and like grow i mean it's interesting if you think about gaudi sagrada familia you know he worked on it his entire life and even after his passing of gaudi you know works continued on sagrada familia but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to build a cathedral you know because that can also be, I mean, as I told you, for example, for me, it's a show like Do It, on which I've been working for 30 years every day, you know, and it continues to grow and evolve and all of that. I mean, and the other advice is, is the Thomas Bayerle advice, you know, he gave to me is that if you're a designer, that you have a garden outside design. You know, if you're a visual artist, you always have to have a garden outside the art world. Um, you know, if you're a, an architect, you always need to have a garden outside the world of architecture uh, and that can be you know so many different things it can be literally a garden or it can be you know a, i mean as i told you in my case it's just going into these other disciplines but it can also be you know uh, i mean uh, something um, um completely unrelated to art or you know it can be something secret also, you know, something which nobody in the art world knows you're doing. So that's kind of bias, that was sort of bias advice, uh, you know, the kind of garden. I think the other thing which is important is to have friends um, outside your field, you know, because it can be become quite, 
karmatic and also limited if as a designer you should spend your entire life in the design world you know so to have friends in science in politics in you know all kinds of other fields is always an advice because i think to have you know too many friends within one's own discipline can be very uh can be very limit kind of very limited maybe or li limiting maybe um the other thing is to kind of publish you know um uh, to find kind of ways of uh of publishing uh and you know not necessarily just you know in magazines or books but to sort of find new new circuits of uh of publishing the work um i think is also uh an advice and then uh yeah i think that's maybe it yeah but it's a long list <laughs> it's a long and fantastic list so thank you so much what are some other example lucas of people kind of advice you liked what people gave um we can think in the group um um so uh, tabitha i remember was never settle i can i can actually send them to you so never settle with anything but just stay curious very similar to your advice isaac kayuki last week said um like in a way um i'm paraphrasing listen more to people that you want to become so not in the sense don't listen to people because they're famous or celebrated but where you believe as a personality there's something that you would like to become yourself so only get advice from 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 these type of people yeah. um then um sharona franklin um had a lot of beautiful advice but one that kind of remained with all of us was with all of us was um to care you have to be careful so if you care for something you know be careful with it um and um yeah, and there's many more, but uh, I think we've kind of gathered this kind of beautiful compendium of very short sentences and um, where there's a lot of overlaps. I remember on Social Club also said, like, be sure to kind of keep your friends and also kind of listen listen to your friends. Um, yeah, but there, there's, there's more and more coming. And another one I think that you said in the beginning, and this kind of, in a way, kind of sums up your entire talk is that of like practicing infinite curiosity and staying the eternal student, no? As, uh, as a, a summary in a way of, of everything that has been said. But I thank you so much for taking your time, Hans Ulrich. I, I know. Thank um, you for your, for your great questions. I like the idea that we end on the sort of listening thing, you know, because ultimately, that was always the advice of Itela Nan, you know, is that we we have her advice was to learn to listen, that we, we are not good enough at listening, you know, and I think that's uh, super super interesting in relation to to where the world stands right now, to to kind of learn to listen. I have learned another one, and that goes for me, um, like never talk more than you're listening, and that kind of goes in the same direction. No, yes, we have a lot to say, but kind of make sure that you are also listening. Um, okay. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful evening and um, stay safe. Take care to all of you students. Thank you for being there. Have a wonderful weekend. And I see you all on Monday for the next juxtaposition talk by American artist Candice Williams. See you Take soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.